Amanda here with Straight Smile Solutions, and today we're going to be talking about posterior crossbites. I know we talked about anterior crossbites. Posterior just means back of the mouth. So you can see in the back where the molars are that how the top teeth go in relative to the bottom teeth. That's what we call a posterior crossbite. The top teeth are actually supposed to be out about half a tooth wider than the lower teeth. So this is about a half a tooth narrower. So it's quite narrow. Uh, it's important that you catch this when it first starts to happen, even if it's happening when they're really little, two, three, four, five, because these are things that could, should be corrected. You need to find out why that's happening. Why is it happening? Most likely it's related to diet. It could be related to thumb sucking. It could be related to bottles, pacifiers, um, many different things, but you do need to correct it. I would say as soon as you start to see it, I would not wait till the child is 10, 11, 12, because it makes it much more difficult to correct and makes it much more uncomfortable and sometimes makes it less stable to correct. And there can be lots of health benefits to getting the upper arch to the proper width, you know, in terms of airway, tongue position, speech, and other things. So any questions this is something I feel very passionate about. So we're getting out of the whole aligner thing and we're going to move into the next bucket, which is phase one and functional appliances. So if you're a pediatric dentist, you're probably super jazzed about this. If you're a general dentist, you may not be that jazzed. Um, but, you know, kiddos are kiddos and I'm going to get you so excited about seeing kiddos because they're actually the most fun patients possible. And doing phase one and functional appliances is a blast. It's so, so, so fun. And you know what? If you don't like kids, Fine. Who cares? Get an get a team member who does, because I guarantee you some team me member in your office is one of those bubbly, fun people. Maybe they have kids. They love working with kids and they would just own this. And you could give them little bonuses for, you know, here and there, whatever you need to do to get them super excited. But the vast majority of phase one and functionals, you as a dentist barely need to touch the patient. It can be totally run by your team member. Of course, within your own dental practice act, you're doing the diagnosis, you're doing the delivery, you're doing the treatment plan. But the check-ins can be done by your team members because there's really nothing that has to really be manipulated as long as you're using um, removables, which is my favorite. So um, this is actually my daughter. This is one of my favorite slides. But you can see here, we started in third grade. We did some expansion. She had about four millimeters of overjet, about 90% overbite. Um, we expanded. We also have an impacted canine here. We consolidated the front spaces and now now we're actually in the fun part, which is the canine exposure. But at least we got the hard stuff out of the way. We fixed the bite. We got everything lined up in the phase one with removable appliances. And now um, we are moving on to the more difficult part. But this could be something where in your office you could do the fun, easy part, getting everything ready, the phase one. And then you can punt it to ortho as needed for the phase two if there's something that you weren't expecting. It's only a small commitment, phase one. So phase one is a small commitment. You know, normally around six to 15 months, depends on when you're starting, where you're just fixing, it's interceptive, right? You're fixing initial problems so that everything, if you line it all up and you get the space, everything is gonna just come in hopefully peachy, you know, at the end. Doesn't always happen that way, weird things can happen, but for the most part it does. And a lot of phase ones, when you start them, sometimes you don't even need phase two. So that's just a blessing and if that happens, the parents are going to think you're the best thing ever. They're going to be singing your praises. Can't promise, never promise. All you can do is promise that it will help to make the phase two less complicated. You're taking the hard stuff, doing it now, early when the patient is compliant and likes to wear things. Um, no one wants to work on 13 or 14 year olds. It's not fun. They're grumpy. They don't want to be there. But the eight and nine year olds want to be there and they would love to wear whatever you give them. They think it's the coolest thing ever. It's just so cool. I can tell you when I was eight, I made retainers out of paper clips and now in layers and I wore them to school and I did such a good job making them. But the teacher actually thought they were a retainer. And they told my mom, like, I think like in a conference, like, oh, she's wearing her retainer. My mom's like, what? So who would have known I would be an orthodontist? But I did think they were super duper duper cool. So. Um, but yeah, phase one price point, I'd say people are charging between $2,500 and $39.99. It really depends on, you know, if you're in network, insurance, all that kind of stuff. Depends on what you're doing. Some people will start phase one even younger, and I call that kind of like a super phase one treatment. Or you might do a pre-phase one, which is maybe just like a habit intervention or an airway appliance. There's a lot of those that are really great for threes, fours, and fives. Um, if you start in phase one, though, you need to keep with the patient patient until you fix the bite. So I would say at least until the bite is corrected. 
Um, and also the front teeth are out of harm's way. So that might mean consolidating, doing some braces on the top teeth, doing some express aligners on the top teeth, doing Invisalign first on the top teeth. Um, so you need to stick with that patient. You can't just wear like a little rubber appliance and say, okay, I'm done with phase one because that's you didn't address all the patient's needs, right? And then in between phase one and phase two, you're gonna have kind of a latency period, might be a few months, might be a few years, where you're just gonna keep an eye on them every six months until they're ready for phase two. The great news is if you do phase one, you can tell the parents that the likelihood of needing really complex stuff and invasive stuff in phase two goes down significantly. So it decreases the likelihood of needing jaw surgery, having impacted teeth, um, needing four by extractions or anything like that. And in, we really harness the growth of the patient in order to get a better outcome. So for example, if you take out upper buys on an overjet patient, all you're doing is just camouflaging, right? And you're making a suboptimal pro like patient profile. The profile isn't looking as good. Better to grow that lower jaw if you have a deficient mandible than to pull out upper teeth in phase two, right? But the biggest mistake often that general dentists make is they don't realize that they need to harness the growth. So they have to really know where the patient is in their growth. And of course, orthodontists are really in tune with this. Pediatric dentists, pediatricians, we know when the growth spurt is happening. You're probably not going to know. And you can't always tell by looking at a patient. Um, you need to ask the right questions. And again, that the, that's where it comes back to the hand wrist. X-ray is really helpful. But ultimately, you need to be asking those puberty questions can be a little bit sensitive. Um, so you can always task, you know, one of your females, uh, female team members to ask the questions on the girls if that's something that you need to do, but you need to know. Because again, we talked about understanding ortho so that you can qualify the referral if you're not gonna be taking it. So if you don't understand, if you're not explaining to the parent that yes, we need to start phase one, we need to send you to ortho because little Jenny here is eight and you know, you're telling me she's already starting to go through puberty. Well, there's eight year olds that are done growing, like done, done, done. You go to a third grade class and the teachers will tell you they're done. You know, they're fully grown eight year olds, um, especially girls. So girls are done growing earlier than two generations, of, you know, for sure. You know, somewhere the average age, I think, is around nine, ten now to be done growing. It's much, much younger. Um, boys as well, a little bit earlier, a little less so. So, you know, you have to time the growth with the maturity and just they may only have eight permanent teeth in but yet they're done growing so what do we do you know so that's why that's why the phase one phase two that's why it's so important mm -hmm. so definitely want to talk about it this is just a great example of um this is one of my cases of how you can do phase one aligners and i was doing five phase one aligners before they were even like a thing so um, Invisalign first obviously came out. It's pretty expensive. If you do Invisalign first, you also have to do Invisalign second. So that's like a $3,000 lab fee almost. Wow. But guess what? You can do it with white labels. You can do it with clear correct. They're totally fine. They don't market it, but you can. You just pay for the flex price. Or in this case, I paid for the unlimited price because I figured that I have five years, right? To go ahead and do it. So I can do as many revisions as I want with unlimited, but really great for space consolidation. So much easier than doing braces on the front four teeth. Often you don't even need attachments if you take it slow and easy like I did here. Um, no attachments, just wear it 22 hours a day. Nine-year-olds, 10-year-olds, they would love to wear this. They I think it's so cool, so definitely. So here's some of the different types of appliances and I've got some of them here. I might show us for demos. So we've got, of course, whoop, dropping stuff. Um, <laughs> we've got expanders, right, with a little key. There's fixed ones and there's removable ones. Here's a nice little removable one. So this is called a Schwartz. So there's a little key that they're gonna crank at home in order to widen the jaw. Obviously, this is a lower one. So on the upper, you're actually splitting the palate if the patient is still growing. If the patient's not growing, all you're doing is tipping teeth. Um, on the lower, you're just tipping teeth, right? But it's a great way to develop out the arches so that if you, like I said, if you grow it, they will come. So if you develop the arches and put the arches where they should have been, you know, if they had developed ideally, um, then the teeth often just come in perfectly to begin with. So it happens. So that's the exciting part. So um, you've got myofunctional trainers, you've got space maintenance appliances, you've got different growth modification devices, like say a twin block that's here. Um, what else? Habit appliances, headgear. There's like a little fixed habit appliance. There's also removable ones. Don't have to do anything sharp or pokey. There's a lot of stuff out there. Um, so, so many different things you can do. 
We talked a little bit about hand wrist x-rays. Again, I developed my own index for this to make it easy. If you have a stuffed plate, you can take a hand wrist x-ray. Great way, especially if you don't want to ask the questions or if you have like a parent that's just not very communicative, you can just take the x-ray, get your answer. You know if they're going through puberty, if they're about to, how much growth you have left. I also have um, another handout called My Phase One Smile Index. Glad to send it to you. Normally there's a fee for that, um, or it's only for my clients, but um, anyone that was on this garrison, as long as you contact me by the end of the week, I will send it to you. Um, I usually wanna talk to you first just to make sure you're gonna use it in the right way, because um, I had some people that wanted to sell it once, so we might chit chat about it, but um, this is a great screen form just to make sure that you understand the why behind phase one. You're checking all the different little boxes to know if this is a potential phase one patient. So, and this is just developed based on my experience um, with patients. It's also really important to have some type of sleep um, or breathing questionnaire. There's adult ones, there's kids ones, there's a bunch on the internet that you can get, that you can repurpose just with ideas, but you know, just questions about feeding, pacifier, um, oral habits, um, skeletal maturity, if they've ever had their tonsils out, if they breathe through their nose. I do recommend that you also take the time, in, especially if you're seeing like patients with open bites or narrow upper jaws, um, to if you're seeing, you know, something that looks kind of off with the bite to have the parents fill out a questionnaire like this. But more importantly, I would say have them come in, you know, at like 10, 11 o'clock at night, get their, their phone and tape the patient. You know, it doesn't even have to be, be nice if, if it's a video because it's nice to see them kind of their mouths open, stuff like that. But five, 10 minutes, a couple different blurbs, bring it into you, look at it, and you're going to see some a lot of really interesting information about the patient's sleep, which is directly related to their orthodontic condition. So it's really quite intertwined. And parents often have no idea that, hey, you know, if I fix their bite, they're going to be sleeping better. Well, if they're going to be sleeping better, they're going to be acting better. They're going to be I mean, this is, I know you're extrapolating it way out and I know it's really kind of fashionable right now. There's a lot of different courses about this, but it really is true. We can't, we can't make promises like, oh, we're gonna cure this, this, you know, this kid from this condition, but you can say that there is a correlation and that often having an, a, a patent airway, a really good airway when the patient's sleeping has a lot of favorable health considerations. And that's pretty much what you can say. You know, and that includes, of course, melon potty, checking all that, checking ad noise, checking tonsils and just having an idea about the airway. So talk a little bit more. We've talked about um, expanders, fixed, removable, bonded, so many different options out there. The cool thing about expanders is that you can bling them out, especially the ones with acrylic, the removable ones, the patient can customize them, put de you know, decals on them, really own it, and they just get so excited. I'm much more of a fan of removable expanders. I have no problem getting patients to be compliant. It's all in how you explain the why behind it. Usually you're gonna have way more emergencies with a fix than you were with a removable. And I mean, they're not like huge emergencies, but it's annoying, you know, in terms of disruptive for a practice. So removables, I mean, it's fully on the patient to wear them. So, but for the vast majority, they wear them great as long as you explain. And, and you don't have to worry about all the food getting stuck up there and the infections and stuff like that can happen. All right. Let's get started. So you've probably heard me talk about rapid palatal expanders before. I'm a huge fan of them. They're great. Um, this is a banded one. So that means that they can fit the bands for you. Um, but it's always better, I think, if you drop some spacers in first. It just helps them be able to fit the bands better. Um, and then do your scan or impression like about a week in advance. Uh, you can also fit your own bands and do a pickup impression, but that's a little bit tricky sometimes because they can lift when you pour them up, so I wouldn't recommend that. Let the lab go ahead and fit your bands. Just remember if you're doing these kind of expanders, I recommend knowing the skeletal age of your patient before you do it. If you don't know how to do that, we've got tons of videos on that, or you can go ahead and connect with me. It's really important that you're not doing these on skeletally mature patients. Or if you are, you need to know what you're doing because there's huge risks. So I don't recommend that um, unless you have a experience doing that. So side effects are significantly bigger. All right, so back to the uh, Hyrax RPE, usually used on growing kids or young teens to expand skeletal crossbites, develop arches, etc. Short, in short, the amount of turns is really going to depend on the skeletal age of the patient, what you're trying to accomplish. So I can't give you a one size fits all approach. Um, but this is generally done faster than some of the other appliances, the banded ones. 
So you're going to see a pretty rapid result, but at the end it needs to be retained or stabilized. So ultimately it all takes about the same amount of time. This is a quad helix. So a quad helix is a slower expansion device. You cannot leave this in here for a really long time because all sorts of crazy things will happen to the arch, to the teeth, to the buckle plate. I've seen it. You don't want to do it. So the from my experience, I usually leave these in about three, four months max um, just to develop the arch. I use these in adults to develop the arch for really slow expansion. You do have to activate these. Um, sometimes they come pre-active, so you need to know the difference. You can't just plop it in if you don't know what you're doing. Um, I will do some videos on activating it later. Um, it's a little bit tricky, uh, but once I have one in my hand, I will do that for you. All right, so the next one that we're going to do here is what I call a bonded hyrax it's basically a banded one that we saw up here okay but there's acrylic over it so it's great for open bite patients that's what i would use this for or and or open bite non-compliant patients will be really great if you want to make it extra funky you can put a thumb crib or a tongue crib on the front kind of mean but um it's really really effective with open bite patients so that's one of my favorites downsides um kind of hard to eat also, there's a risk for decay, so please don't put this in your non-compliant patients that you aren't following up with, but it's a great appliance. Works the same as this one up here, same stipulations and regulations. Next one, I call this a unilateral shorts. Maybe I should go to the regular shorts first. This is your standard shorts, okay? So this is basically a slower version of the RP that we had up here. Slower, um, less turns. Great because it's removable, customizable, fun colors. You can do it a little bit in a little bit older patient, or you can do it in a really little patient. You don't have to worry about having permanent teeth in, banding to permanent teeth. Um, very compliant. So I think that's a great appliance. I use them all the time. It can also be customizable. You can add um, acrylic to the posterior teeth. I don't have that feature right now to help with open bites or vertical issues. You can add a thicker bite plate on the anterior to help with deep bite issues. Fantastic appliance, by far my favorite. This is like kind of a funky version of it. As you can see, this probably is for a patient that has some type of unilateral crossbite issues. Dr. Amanda from Straight Smile Solutions. And today we're going to be talking a little bit more about expansion, specifically expansion in phase one patients and when to use an expander. And unfortunately, there's no like easy way to wrap this up in a tidy box with a bow. Um, it really just comes with experience. Um, but I'll go through a few scenarios and give you a few tips of kind of how I advise my clients when to expand and how I teach them about expansion. And over time, as they start to see more and more patients, they start to understand. So um, if you have any questions or if you need help with a case, feel free to visit streetsmilesolutions.com. There is a link under the services page um, to sign up um, so that we can help you immediately with your cases. So basically in a nutshell, let's talk a lot about what is an expander and what, what is expansion? So you can get expansion in a variety of different ways. If you're looking for dramatic expansion or expansion more to two to three, more than two to three millimeters, I do recommend an actual expander. This is a fixed expander right here. This is our shorts or removable expander. Um, you can see that there's an ex like a jack screw in the midline area. So, a fixed one means it's glued in. In order to make this one, you're gonna to wanna to put spacers in first if you need them. Um, take a scan or an impression, send it to the lab. They'll fit the bands and construct this. You'll put the spacers back in a few days before delivery, pull them out at delivery and deliver it. You're gonna bond this just like you would a space maintainer with some, I like to use like, um, there is band cement, but usually I'll use like a key tack type of thing, modified glass ionomer. That works good. Um, of course, my first choice for expanders is always the removables like these right here. Um, just speak for hygiene, for our patient experience. If you'd start doing a lot of bandits, you're gonna have a lot of emergencies and a lot of drama. Um, so always good to start with the fit with the removable, um, explain compliance to the patient and parent and explain the upgrade fee process if they need to upgrade to banded I usually recommend charging an additional maybe 200 to 300 um, per arch if they if they don't if they are non-compliant and they need banded. Of course, if the parents are adamant that they want banded and not removable, that's fine. You can start there. Um, of course, you're not going to charge that upgrade fee, but you let the parents know there's going to be a lot of food restrictions, and if there's multiple breakage or uh, emergency appointments, there may be additional fees for that. Um, 
usually, like I said, this is just a way better experience for everyone. There's almost no eight, nine, 10 year olds, seven, eight, nine, 10 year olds that I can't get to be compliant, you know, assuming that I, I get a pretty good vibe initially when I get to know the parents and the kids, see how the, the uh, dynamics are going. I'm looking at lots of things on the kids. Is the kid brushing your hair, brushing their teeth, um, trimming their nails? How's the skin? How are they dressing? Are they generally a compliant child? And how much, how is the relationship between the parent and, and patient? Is this something, if I give them something simple to do, which is just putting this in your mouth and wearing it during the day, taking it out during lunchtime, putting it in a case and brushing it, are they going to be able to do this? And if I see a patient that comes in who's disheveled, um, unwashed, unbathed, can't handle basic hygiene, then no, I'm, matter of fact, I might not partner with them at all, or I might wait till they get a little bit older. So just things to think about. So anyways, I digress. So you can get some expansion in these type of... Um, pediatric, uh, what do we call them? Bio trainers. So you can get maybe two to three millimeters max. But if you're really looking for dramatic expansion, you really got to go with the expanders. Um, for me, I like to go slow and low unless there's some reason, some urgency. And it really depends on the frequency of turns really will depend on the age of the patient, the skeletal maturity of the patient, what we're trying, what our objectives are. Um, usually maybe two or three turns. Um, on a removable per week, maybe a little bit more on a fixed. Um, total turns will depend on how the patient responds. You have to keep a, a close eye on it. Um, you know, of course, don't want to overturn. Um, you want to make sure the patient's coming back regularly every two to three weeks or three to four weeks in your office to be checked. You're checking a bunch of stuff. We can talk about what that looks like. So, I mean, if you, I had one patient that they basically ghosted, they disappeared, they hadn't expanded and they were just cranking it like crazy. Of course, there's a limit eventually to how much it cranks, but I mean, they totally blew the bite, you know. Um, they, you know, we lost control of them, we tried to get a hold of them, we were sending them letters and certified letters, but you really don't want to be partnering with parents that you don't have a good connection with because you are basically breaking the patient's jaw, you know. You, it's not fused, so it's not broken, but you're, you know, distracting it. Um, and things can happen if it's done incorrectly. So you don't just want to be doing this, you know, out of control. Okay, so more things. I mean, you can bling out these expanders in a variety of different ways to control habits, tongue position, tongue thrusts. Um, you can also straighten teeth by putting all kinds of little screws and pistons in them. There's so much cool stuff you can do. The cool thing is, is that if you expand patients when they're young, um, you know, with these kind of $100 to $200 expanders and just let them be, the teeth actually come up usually quite ideally to begin with. They don't come up crooked because you made space for them. You know, assuming you're doing this before too many teeth are in, you know, when the patient is six, seven, eight, nine, maybe. Um, not when the patient's 11, that's not going to do much. You're going to have to do braces too. A lot of times if you do this really young, you don't even need braces. Or if you do, it's it, the need is like need, not need. It's, it's a want. It's not a need. It's just aesthetic. So that's pretty sweet. And you can take a case from a two-year braces case with extractions down to a three-month clear aligner case, you know, just because you made space at the beginning and it ends up being way cheaper. Um, again, more cool ways. I mean, you can make these things really fun. If you're going to put all kinds of bling and glitters and decals in them, of course, it's going to cost a little bit more. This is an expander here as well, but this is also an expander that helps to, it works similar to the Invisalign MA appliance. As a matter of fact, this is the original Invisalign MA appliance. This is a twin block. So um, it's going to advance the mandible, help grow the mandible, as well as correct the jaw um, and the bite. So that's pretty cool. I mean, what type of seven, eight, nine-year-old girl would not want to wear this to school? They trust me. They all want to wear this to school. That's really cool. So um Again, more different modifications. This one you can use, and this is an older kid, so you're using it at the same time as braces. Um, this is a fixed appliance, but it has acrylic on the posterior teeth. This is like Carrie's waiting to happen. You have to have a really great patient. You gotta have a really close eye on this, but this would be really great for a patient who maybe had an open bite or a habit, well, an open bite, because this is going to help to close an open bite. All that acrylic on the posterior teeth intrudes the posterior teeth, closes down the bite. So, And you can make the opposite for a deep bite. So, so many cool things you can do for $200. So today we're going to be talking about expanders in general. And it doesn't matter whether this is a fixed expander, a metal expander, if it's cemented to the teeth, if it's removable. This is a removable type. It actually comes in and out. Let's just pretend like 
it's all the same, really. So this is a standard upper retainer, uh, excuse me, upper expander. You can see here there's two holes, okay? There's a top hole and a bottom hole. When we put the key in, we're going to want to put the key in towards the top hole. By top, I mean the, the hole closest to the front teeth, okay? Now, there's all different ways to kind of do it incorrectly. And unfortunately, if you do it even a little bit inc incorrectly, it doesn't work. So I'm going to try to show you the right way to do it. And then I'm going to show you some of the wrong ways to do it. And hopefully um, you'll get the hang of it. It takes some time. So put your key in the top hole, the one closest to the front teeth. Okay. Not in the bottom hole. So let's go ahead and do that right now. Now, the one of the keys or one of the key points is you need to make sure the, the hole is clean. So if it's not clean, make sure your child brushes it first and you put the key in and then you're going to go ahead and turn it towards the middle of the mouth, towards the palate. Okay. So I'm turning it, turning it, turning it, turning it, turning it until a new hole comes up. Can you all see the new hole? And it needs to be a full new hole, not a half new hole, a full new hole. Then when you pull it out, you want to pull it out. I usually use another finger towards the middle of the mouth. Make sure you don't rock that turn back. Make sure the new hole, the full new hole is still there the whole time. There you go. So watch this. Boom. Take it out. Sometimes it's tricky. You don't want to stab the patient. But see, my new hole is still there and you can double check it. Make sure it's still there. Make sure it's a full hole. You should be able to put your key in. Yes, I can. And you're done. That is your turn. Now, the actual amount of turns that you want to do is prescribed by your doctor. You cannot decide because it really depends on the skeletal maturity of the patient, um, how fused the palate is. There's a, so many dynamics and variables that goes into picking how many turns and how frequently you do the terms. So I'm not going to tell you that. It is a special algorithm just for each patient. And if you overturn expanders, very, very, very bad things can happen. Okay. If you underturn expanders, so what? It takes a little bit longer. So listen to your doctor and make sure you're coming regularly for your appointments. Don't keep turning if you haven't seen your doctor as requested. That's my, my key for you. You don't want to be in that situation. So, okay. So I showed you how to do it correctly, how not to do it. So how not to do it, of course, would be to do it the inverse way, to do it backwards. That would be making your palate smaller and not bigger, right? Um, another way to not do it is to turn it halfway or to turn it down. And then when you pull it out to rock it back up. So basically you're just going like that, back and forth, back and forth. You're seesawing instead of doing the full turn. So what should it feel like after you do your turn? After you do your turn, it's likely going to feel like a lot of pressure. So sometimes it's good to do your turn at nighttime, right before bed, after the child's brushed and flossed their teeth. Um, sometimes if they're a sensitive child, you may want to give them some normal Motrin, ibuprofen, whatever your pediatrician recommends that you take about an hour before the turn. It's really up to the child and how you're feeling. Um, pretty much that's it. Uh, you do your turn and then you wait until the next turn is supposed to happen. So and most likely you'll be coming back regularly to visit your doctor to check on the turns. They're going to be checking all different things to see how the turns are going. Um, what's normal to see if the turns are actually going right and everything you're doing everything correctly, you should see a gap forming in between your front teeth. Now, if you had crowded teeth to begin with, you may not see a gap in that case, but uh, that's normal because your arch is getting wider. And if your arch is getting wider, right? Gaps are forming. You're making more space for the teeth to fit in. So that's great news. So anyways, that's pretty much it. And generally these expanders stay in for at least a few months um, to go ahead and maintain the width of the arch so that it doesn't relapse. So that's my tip about removable Schwartz type plate expanders. But like I said, fundamentally it works similarly to a fixed expander. Fixed expanders do often work a little bit quicker, um, but there's pros and cons to each one and your doctor will pick the right expander for you. So this is kind of your standard mini fixed expander. When would I use this? I would use this in a patient that was not yet skeletally mature. Remember how we find out about this? There's many different ways to you know, find out about skeletal maturity. In boys, of course, you're looking for signs of puberty uh, being completed like facial hair, um, feet are done growing. Uh, what else? Uh, obviously, voice change and Adam's apple. Those are the four things I ask about. This should be a really comfortable conversation to have with the parents and the kids, and it's often quite obvious, so sometimes you don't even need to ask. Um, for girls, it's a little bit more of a sensitive conversation. Um, remember, for boys, the age could be anywhere from 11 to 17, 
average maybe 12, 13, 14. For girls, it could be anywhere from age 9 to 14. Average is probably, and it depends on your demographics, is probably 11, 12 or 10, 11 even. So for girls, you may not, it may not be as a parent. Um, you're going to have to ask those questions about when menses began. And it's, it's a sensitive question, but it's important that you explain the why behind it, because if you're trying to do um, expansion or growth modification on a patient that is skeletally done growing, it's really probably not going to work. So that's why you need to know. So um, if somehow you can't get that information for whatever reason, and I don't see what not, or if the answer is no, they're not skeletally mature, but you're trying to figure out what type of wig room you might have, another great idea is to take a hand wrist x-ray. You can do that on a regular Ceph plate. And there's some, there's some give and take in learning how to do it. But if you do take a good hand is wrist x-ray, I can teach you how to interpret it. It's very easy to tell, to read the growth plates. So anyways, back to our expander here from Specialty Appliances. This is a standard mini expander. It also has soldered Facebook hooks on it. Um, these Facebook hooks can be used for protraction face mask or advancing the maxilla in a growing patient to jump across bite. They're fantastic. It's really easy. Check out some of our previous videos. But today we're talking a little bit more about how to turn the fixed expander. So remember, always look for the arrow and it's, there should be an arrow on it and it's really hard to see. The arrow is pointing down here, okay? Um, this 12 tells you, well, if I turn it over, you can see the 12 better. Um, this tells you the size of the expander, you know, how much width you can expect maximum. You're not gonna turn it that far, but there's usually sevens and twelves and they'll try to probably fit the biggest one they can get in. But if you have a preference, you need to let them know. Okay, so see the arrow going down, right? You see it? Oh, wait, it's going that way. Okay, there we go. So you wanna make sure you put your key in in the top hole, okay? And there sometimes could be more than one hole showing and you wanna turn it in the direction that the arrow says to go, okay? And sometimes when you try to get your key in, there is some gunk in there, actually more than often. Okay, you can see I put my key in, okay? This is my favorite kind of key, this is the swivel key. I would recommend you order these. It may not always come with your case and I would always have extras because the patients will lose them. They cost like 50 cents, you can get them on eBay um, or at any orthodontic supply company. So put your key in, in the, away for or in the direction where you can turn and then you're going to go ahead and do the full turn okay do the full turn until you see a new hole come up can you see the new hole the full new hole okay this is the key when they pull this out remember this is the patient's laying down so this is a little trickier and it's kind of dark so someone needs to be holding a flashlight you have to have a bright light when you pull the key out the new hole should still be there. See it? And if they're not sure, because you don't want to rock it back, then you should put your key in the new hole and make sure that you can put your key in the new hole, which I can. I just did. So anyways, that's the, that's the trick for the expander. And I would definitely have the parent practice it outside the mouth. I'm going to roll this turn back now, just so we have it ready to go again. But I would definitely have the parent practice outside the mouth before you glue it in. And then have the parent do the turn in the mouth while you are still watching it. Now I'm rolling it back. This is not the way to do it, okay? But, and different expanders are gonna turn different directions. So you just have to follow the arrow is the main thing, okay? So again, follow the arrow. When you do the turn, make sure the whole new hole comes up. If it's occluded or full of gunk, they might need to use a toothpick or clean it out to make sure they got the whole new hole. And when they take the key out, the whole new hole should still be there the whole time. Don't rock it back, okay? Frequency of turns is going to really depend on the age of the patient, what goal you're trying to get, um, how skeletally mature they are. So some people are turning once a day. For this fixed one, obviously shorts is a removable and they're gonna be a lot slower. Some people are turning three times a week. There's a whole algorithm that goes with that and it's not something that I can probably do on a webinar. But um, if you're working with us at Straight Smile Solutions, we'd be glad to explain more um, on how you do this. And remember risks, if you turn too fast, too frequent, or on a patient that's skeletally mature, there's all kinds of risks that can happen. I've seen teeth go through the buccal plate. I've seen loss of vitality of teeth. I'm not saying I did this. These are ones I've seen other people do. Um, and all kinds of really scary things, as well as just blowing out their face and looking really bad. 
So um, let's pain, discomfort, hemorrhaging. I've heard of people, I've heard of death, um, hemorrhaging out their eyeballs if you try to expand it too much. You need to make sure if you're using an expander, especially a fixed one like this, that you're doing this on a compliant patient. You have a good relationship with the parent. You do not want to let the patients go away for an extended period of time. You should be seeing these patients at least every two to three weeks during the active expansion time, if not every week, um, to check on many different things. And today we're gonna to be talking about this. We're gonna be talking about activating your Schwartz or Sagittal appliance, how to deliver it, the first step in a series of presentations about doing this. We all know that expanding the arches is huge. We know that expanding the arches is really part of creating the airway and establishing airway in your sleep disorder breathing patients. We know that this can be an integral part of all orthodontic treatment. Pediatric dentists are doing it. General dentists are doing it. Orthodontists are doing it. Everybody loves to expand arches, okay? So this is gonna be the first in a series. Just real quick, number one, this is a key. This is my favorite kind of key. This is a safety swivel key, okay? This is the only key you should use. Don't use the other ones. Order them, don't be cheap. Number two, this is a nice little Schwartz appliance. It's very pretty. So it's glow in the dark. I'm huge on glow in the dark appliances because the patients will lose them sometimes and it's easy to find them. But basically make sure, number one, that you've taken a good impression. Make sure that it's not distorted. Do not send off a junky impression. Number two, when it comes back, make sure that the keyhole is fully, you know, reversed back to the beginning point. Sometimes when it's going in shipping, it can open up a little bit. Number three, you wanna go ahead and make sure you can deliver this appliance passively, that there's nice retention, adequate retention. If you can't deliver it passively, you're not gonna be able to activate it. So start there. If there's a problem, then you might need to redo the impression. Maybe there was distortion. Maybe the patient has lost a lot of teeth since then. You might be able to work around it, but do make sure you can do that. From there, you might need to adjust the clasp. We'll do a separate video about adjusting clasp later, but let's start with just the basic passive delivery. Once you can get it 100% delivered passively with adequate retention, you're ready to rock and roll. And that will be our next step in the series of adjusting your Schwartz and Sagittal plants. As you can see, I have my two trusty pliers here. This is my three prong plier. Why is it called three prong? Because it has three prongs, right? And this is what I call a bird beak plier. There's a couple other names for this. I think some people call it like a 139 plier or something like that. But basically it has a square tip and then a rounded tip. So if you do not have these two pliers, I would not attempt to start adjusting a uh, retainer jet because you need both of those. All right, so we have three different types of clasps here. Okay, we have a C clasp, a ball clasp, and an Adams clasp. These are your three basic types of retainer clasps. When you make uh, retainers uh, or any type of orthodontic appliance, you can specify which clasp you want. But my suggestion, unless you have a specific reason, is to leave it up to the lab tech to um, select the best clasp. And you can tell them that. And if you don't, it's pretty much um, understood that they're going to select the best one for that case. Personally, this is not my favorite at all. I don't like these because they bend easily um, and get distorted and things happen. So this is definitely my favorite for mixed dentition, the Adams clasp. Um, pretty indestructible, hard to mess up, and they fit pretty well. Downsize is sometimes the patients are going to bite on the clasp. There's not much you can do about that. Um, if they do, they just need to get used to it. Um, ball clasps are great, but they break easily. So if you put one on, you want to have many because if you lose one, um, it's always good to have another one. But besides that, the only other thing you got going on here that needs to be adjusted is the labial bow. And this is totally adjusted wrong the way this came on this model, or maybe someone was playing with it already, but this is definitely not granted the teeth are chipped, not where it should be. So it's over adjusted. So, but today we're going to be focusing on these three clasps. So basically in a nutshell, this is the way I adjust them and everyone might be slightly differently. Do this. Woo. This one is tight. I, I, I can get this. Whoa. Great fit. Orthodontic lab. There we go. Got it off. Okay. That's a great sign if it's tight. All right. So to adjust a C clasp, I just tighten a tiny bit right here. The main thing is the ball needs to be under the undercut. It cannot impinge in the gingiva. And when I try retainers in, the first thing I'm gonna do is snap them down and check the gingiva and see if they are, you know, engaged or impinging the gingiva at all. Cause start there, okay? And once you're kind of out of the woods, 
then make sure it's seating fully. The acrylic needs to be fully seating. If it's rocking or anything like that, it's not ready yet for adjusting. So before you start messing with the clasp, you want to make sure that your retainer is actually seating and seating comfortably. Once you get it seating and it's too, a little too loose, then you can start adjusting the clasp. So this one's an easy adjust. This one's also a pretty easy adjust. You're just going to use your three prong, okay? And you're just going to tighten it just a tiny bit right there at the little um, bend, okay? And sometimes you need to tighten it here and here. Just a tiny squeeze, a little bit goes a long way. If you overdo it, you can either flip this around and do it the other way, or you can use the square portion of this to go ahead and loosen it. And you know what? You're just going to need to play with it to try to practice it. But you know, in a nutshell, it's something like this, okay? To tighten like this, okay? To loosen, you could either do like this or you can flip it around and do like this, okay? All different ways, no wrong or right way. Um, with the Adams clasp, I always start adjusting closest to the acrylic, okay? And if you're trying to Tighten it, I'm gonna squeeze like this and this, both spots, okay? If you're trying to loosen it, the opposite generally, okay? But remember, this will often interfere with the occlusion, but not a huge deal if it's in mixed dentition. So that's pretty much it. That's how I adjust retainer clasp. It's gonna take a lot of trial and error for you to learn how to do this um, more ideally. As for the labial bow, that's a whole, ooh, it's a lot more challenging, okay? So, you know, hopefully your labial bows are coming ideal um for sure and if you're using this just for a functional appliance for ortho it's probably not a huge deal at all to have the labial bowl um you know contacting and an ideal but if you're using it for actual retention it is a huge deal so hopefully we'll get to that at a later time all right have a great day thanks for listening to our video